Hi, I'm Laura Weatherington, joining you from the Netherlands to talk about the final poem in Hank Rousseau's book, Camisa. Rousseau's book blends archival historical research with the author's lived experience in Cape Town, South Africa. First, a bit of context. Hank Rousseau grew up in Cape Town and now teaches at the University of Louisiana, Lafayette. His book, Camisa, runs 136 pages and contains seven sections. Themes include the speaker's memories of Cape Town, interactions with family and family friends and making sense of the country's historical moment, and the author's own whiteness within the history of South Africa. In the prologue, Rousseau explains that the title is a reference to an urban legend where the quay word Camisa was thought to mean place of sweet waters and to reference the underground springs and streams that run from Table Mountain to the ocean, when in actuality, the word simply means water or fresh water. The X instead of a C uh, signals Cape Town's multiple intersecting, intersecting languages and therefore a wide range of possible pronunciations. The final poem in the book is a 65 page serial poem. In the two page author's introduction to that section, Rousseau recounts finding Helena van de Kub's name in an online archive of the Dutch East India Company or VOC from 1727. He says her occupation was listed as runaway and that quote, 14 women and men soon after echoed her action, end quote. The title reproduces the lowercase spelling of Helena van de Kub's first name from one place in the archives a shortened version of her name from juridical proceedings from 1737, and Rousseau's transliteration of her name into Lantara, which is the script used by the Bugis-speaking people from Indonesia. Because the theme of the conference is care, I want to borrow a framework for this from Rolando Vasquez, a sociologist here in the Netherlands. In his closing statement for this year's decolonial summer school, he outlined three elements in what he called the movement or pedagogies of decoloniality, positionality, relationality, and transition. If I understand this correctly, positionality is a way of knowing yourself with respect to place and time and history, particularly coloniality, and I'm quoting, beyond our self-identity or identity politics. So there's a level of complexity about what constitutes selfhood here, the questioning of which Vasquez says, quote, leads us to humbling, to owing, not owning. In an article about a service learning trip in Mexico for a Dutch college class, Vasquez says that, quote, promoting intercultural dialogues across global divides requires us to unbuild the assumed privilege of the West, the assumed superiority of being modern, of being ahead in the history of progress, of being the one holding the camera. This unbuilding, I think, is the first element which lays the foundation for re relationality, which involves, quote, practicing listening as a verb, which is only possible when you're positioned. This is a process of, quote, growing beyond the enclosed self, remembering who we are, overcoming earthlessness, individualism, end quote. The third element is transition, which in Vasquez's words means engaging in the practices of worlding. This is a question of coalition building of, quote, creating other possibilities, transforming pain into creativity, a grounded, relational, humble practice. So this framework of care is a movement that begins with seeing ourselves in relation to others, to the earth, to place, then engaging and relating with others from this position of understanding. And finally, building toward other possibilities, worlding. Rousseau engages in this first element of movement by creating a character who penned the archive. He explains, the VOC kept track of enslaved people in far greater detail than its employees. In the handwriting of a nameless VOC functionary who listed in the inventory the names of enslaved people at the old slave lodge, I recognized by implication my own hand in the document. I named the functionary Peter Fury after my grandfather. Rousseau's positionality is present in his use of an autobiographical lyric eye. I say this because there are five images in the book and this is the first one, right? It's his birth certificate. 
And the speaker here connects personal history to his position within coloniality on the following page, where the text parses the meaning of the numbers on the form, which signify his parents' birth dates, sex assigned at birth, and race. So he begins with the state's documentation of his own filiation. The final poem addresses a U, Helena von der Kab, signified by a capital letter U. He explains that this is the formal address in Dutch, similar to VU in French, but he uses the capital letter, which is not a common practice, at least not here in the Netherlands. I read this move as a visual equalizing between the I and the U in English, and therefore think of it as a mark of positionality. Rousseau's direct address to Helena is evidence of both positionality and relationality. The first two elements are reciprocal and deeply rooted in listening. Jonathan Culler coins the term triangulated address. For when a term, <clears throat> for when a poem is ostensibly speaking to an other while really talking to an audience, he calls this the root form of presentation for lyric. This triangulated address abounds in Rousseau's final poem, creating an invitation for the reader to engage in this movement. So here on the left, you have the Lantara script for Lena's name and a comma, right? It's a, a kind of letter. And then in the, in the following page here on the right, it says in Afrikaans, uh, what say you, Lena? Rousseau's relationality is most present though in his documental poetics. I wanna clarify that I'm thinking of Michael Leong's concept from his recent book, Contested Records. Leong takes, and I'm quoting him here, a cultural formalist approach to interpret the stakes that contemporary poets have within the public sphere by paying close attention to the specific techniques they use to transform material documentation. By using material documentation as his primary criteria, Leong creates an umbrella term which cuts across documentary, investigative and conceptual poetry and circumvents fuzzy claims about the distinction between conceptual and documentary work, either along the lines of literary communities or according to ethics, technique, or social justice. Rousseau's use of documents includes archival scans, archival transcription, and in-text citation. So here's one example of an archival image um, and the transcription on a, on a subsequent page. Um, all three of the images in the final poem are ar archival scans whose textual fragments appear and reappear in the writing. In addition to reproducing the archive, uh, Rousseau uses italics to set off quoted text from books he's read, then puts the author's name in an open parenthesis at the end of the line. And so here's um, the italics and then Diak Quain in uh, parentheses at the end of the line. The effect of this open parenthesis is both a porous border with the rest of the poem and a foregrounding of the politics of citation, owing, not owning, to come back to Vasquez. Vasquez's third element, transition, is apparent in the serial composition of the poem. And here I'm thinking about Joseph M. Conte's article on serial poems, particularly his descriptions of modular sections in Leslie Scalapino's way as existing, quote, in both a permutational and contrapuntal relation with themselves and those that follow. The 65 page poem is made up of 57 sections, none longer than two pages. The sections often begin again transcrib transcribing Helena von der Kab, 1725 in Mart, and then spirals out to the present or to a shoe shop on Main or imagines Helena, the hero who inspired the maronage of 14 people, then returned to the old lodge and set it aflame. Each segment ends with Lantara, Lantara punctuation, sometimes the lyric simply left hanging. This rhizomatic proliferation of relation is exactly what's at the heart of Rousseau's poetics. In speaking about the imaginary potential of the archive, Achille Mbembe says, through archived documents, we are presented with pieces of time to be assembled, fragments of life to be placed in order, one after the other, in an attempt to formulate a story that acquires its coherence through the ability to craft links between the beginning and the end. A montage of fragments thus creates an illusion of totality and continuity. Rousseau's serial structure resists this concept that Mbembe calls an instituting imaginary. 
Instead of linear time, Rousseau's poem dilates and circles back on very small moments in the archive. There's a fluidity between Vasquez's elements, positionality, relationality, and transition, because interdependence and motion is a large part of the theory and practice of decoloniality, as I understand it. I wanna posit that these three parts are one movement, one cycle, like the formation of and breaking of a wave. Edouard Glissant calls up the figure of water in a variety of contexts in his book, The Poetics of Relation. And in one moment, he describes something like Vasquez's movement. He says, the only discernible stabilities in relation have to do with the interdependence of the cycles operative there, how their corresponding patterns of movement are in tune. Rousseau cites Glissant and Rousseau's book includes the water archive as a motif. This motif points to Table Mountain, the place where the fabled waters of Camisa were said to have sprung and the place where Helena van de Kaab was said to have lived while outside captivity. It is present in the poem's design, uh, often an open field, which creates rivering to use a typographical term. The motif of water archives shows up in the fluid switches between languages and in the theme of arch archival research. It also points toward the poem itself as an archive. As a person just beginning to understand what decoloniality might mean in theory and in practice, reading Camisa through Vasquez's framework has been an instruction in what care can look like. How does a writer construct an eye, not as a standalone entity rooted in individuality, but instead defined by interactions and relations to people, to place, to history? Camisa gives us one answer, documenting fluid movement toward another possible world. Thank you. <laughs>